Hello all, I am Sharon Sunil doing my Masters in Biotechnology from St. Thomas College Bilai. Today in this video, I will be explaining about Biology of Cancer guided by Ms. Sulagna Ghosh Parman. So I will be explaining the Biology of Cancer under these following headings. Cancer cell breaks the most basic rules of cell behavior by which multicellular organisms are built and maintained and they exploit every kind of opportunity to do so. Cancer cells are defined by two heritable properties which basically makes them different from the normal cells. They are, they reproduce in defiance of the normal restrictions on the cell growth and division and they invade and colonize territories normally reserved for the other cells. It is the combination of these two properties that actually makes cancer particularly very dangerous. An abnormal cell that grows, that is that increases in mass and proliferate, that is they divide out of control will give rise to a tumor or neoplasm which literally means a new growth. So cancer cell uh, results or cancer results from failures of the mechanism that usually controls the growth and proliferation of cell during normal developments and throughout adult life intricate genetic control system regulate the balance between cell birth and cell death in response to growth signals growth inhibiting signals and death signals cancer occurs when the mechanism that maintain normal proliferation rates malfunction to cause excess cell division. The losses of cellular regulation that give rise to most or all cases of cancer result from genetic damage that is often caused by tumor promoting chemicals, hormones and sometimes viruses. In this figure we can see the invasion of normal tissue by a growing tumor. Uh, this is a light micrograph of a section of human liver that shows a metastasized melanosarcoma which is uh, red in color that is invading the normal liver tissue. Carcinogenesis The cancer forming process called carcinogenesis is also known as oncogenesis or tumorogenesis is an interplay between the genetics and the environment. So most cancer arise after genes are altered by cancer cons uh, causing chemicals known as carcinogens or by errors in their copying and repair. Even if the genetics damage occur in only one somatic cell, division of this cell will tr transmit the damage to the daughter cells giving rise to a clone of altered cells. Rarely, however, does mutation in a single gene leads to the onset of cancer. Uh, more typically, a series of mutation in multiple genes create a progressively more rapidly proliferating cell type that escapes the normal growth rest, uh, restraints, create in, creating an opportunity for additional mutation. So time plays an important role in cancer. It may take many years for a cell to accumulate to form a tumor, so most cancer develop later in life. The requirement for multiple mutations also lowers the frequency of cancer compared with what it would be if tumorogenesis were triggered by a single mutation. So the transition of a normal cell into a tumor cell is referred to as transformation. The transition from a normal to a transformed state is a multi-step process involving genetic as well as epigenetic changes and selection of cells with the progressively increasing capacity for proliferation, invasion and metastasis occur. Conceptually, this process can be divided into three distinct stages, initiation, promotion and progression. So in this figure we can see. The first step in the process is initiation. It is a process in which normal cells are changed so that they are able to form tumors. It involves a permanent heritable change in the expression of cancer related gene of the transformed cell by either genetic change or by epigenetic change. 
Although the direct genetic change is the most common heritable change in a cell that can produce a cancer initiating event, change of a gene expression due to epigenetic changes can also cause a cancer initiating event. The second step is the promotion. Promotion is generally associated with increased proliferation of initiated cells which increases the population of initiated cells. Then comes progression. Progression refers to the process of acquiring additional genetic changes due to the genetic instability that lead to malignancy. Additional genetic changes in cancer critical genes are the force that drives tumorogenesis. Each successive genetic change is thought to prom provide the developing tumor cell with important growth advantage that allows cell clones to outgrow their more normal neighboring cells. So this is the overview of uh, carcinogenesis. So when a normal cell undergoes DNA damage due to environmental agents like chemicals, radiations, viruses or, the, or due to any inheritable mutations. So uh, the DNA damage uh, if occur and if there is any, if it is successfully repaired then very good. If not, if there is a fail in repairing, repairing due to DNA, uh, thereby DNA repair cell growth apoptosis. So because of that, if there is any kind of mutation which is affecting them and because of which repair has not taken place. So mutation in normal in, in somatic cells start to occur which uh, activates the growth promoting oncogenes and the uh, inactivation of tumor suppressor genes. So we will be talking about these two genes in the uh, uh, video ahead. Then uh, an impaired apoptosis all these three will lead to an altered gene product abnormal structure and regular, regularly regulatory proteins uh, in the normal cell thereby forming a malignant tumor. The next diagram talks about the clonal evolution as I told that in a cell there has to be multiple mutations and that is when the cancer is uh, started. So uh, this, ish, this image shows that how accidentally uh, in the first step how accidentally a, step, uh, a cell uh, is mutated. Then again due to some reason it gets mutated and again and again uh, it gets mutated. In the end we get a very dangerous cell proliferation or a tumor uh, formation. Now the, now the properties of cancer. So clearly to produce a cancer a cell must acquire a range of apparent properties, a collection of subversive new skills as it evolves. So different cancer requires different combination of these properties. Nevertheless, cancers all share some common features. By definition, they all ignore or misinterpret normal social controls so as to proliferate and spread where normal cells would not. So these defining properties are commonly combined with other features that help the miscreant to arise and thrive. So uh, there are a few uh, key attributes of cancer cells in general which would be as follows. The first one is the uncontrolled division which is based on density dependent division, independent division which is based on density independent division. So in this diagram we can see how uh, there is a, a differentiation done between the normal mammalian cell and the cancerous cell. So in the normal cell uh, the, uh, there are just few cells initially being placed on a dish and then slowly it starts to divide in such a way that it completes only a single layer that is they stop dividing that is they are density dependent, uh, dependent growth occurred there that is uh, due to a density dependent inhibition uh, after forming a single layer the cell division stopped. And even if we remove few cells again the space is being filled up but there is no further uh, multiplication or proliferation taking place. But when it comes to cancer cells, cancer cells do not exhibit that anchorage dependence or uh, density dependent inhibition. They just grow, grow. They do not stop on to the uh, stop on to forming a single layer. They uh, make multiple layers on top cell on, on top of one cell on the other. 
and thereby making a huge tumor. So this is the one property which is the uncontrolled division of cancerous cell. Then the second property which is the loss of contact inhibition that is when one cell comes in contact with another cell due to uh, the contact inhibition it do not uh, multiply further. But when these cells, when these normal cells due to mutation or due to any other reason when they are transformed into a cancerous cell they lose the very property of contact inhibition and so therefore they keep on multiplying in an uninhibited manner uh, thereby uh, causing uh, formation of tumor. The third property is that cancer cells stimulate their own growth. So there are different autocrine growth stimulations that they produce by their own which actually sustains them and they do not depend on any other sources for their growth. The next is the resistance for programmed cell death. So uh, this is a diagram which shows that how cancer cells uh, are not affected by the apoptosis uh, means because of their increased cell division the apoptosis uh, gets decreased. So the failure of cancer cells to undergo normal programmed cell death contributes substantially to the tumor development. So in this diagram we can see how in the first case there is a when there is a normal cell division and along with it there is a normal apoptosis a homeostasis is maintained. But uh, in the second case if there is an increased cell division but a normal apoptosis that can lead to tumor formation and the other case when if there is a normal cell division but there is a decreased apoptosis that also will lead to tumor formation. So that is how uh, this is how cancer cell resists to program cell death. Next is metastasis. Cancer cell generally need to spread and multiply at new sites in the body in order to kill us through a process called metastasis. This is the most deadly and least understood aspect of cancer being responsible for 90% of cancer associated death. Metastasis is itself a multi-step process. The cancer cells first have to invade local tissues and vessels, move through the circulation, leave the vessels and then establish a new cellular colonies at distant places. So we, uh, as we can see in this diagram, so they invade the local places uh, and after uh, they come out from that and they, uh, they enter the circulations and then through that they reach different different uh, places, distant places and then they invade in that place. So that is called as metastasis. Next is angiogenesis. So even though cancer cells are abnormal, they still require adequate oxygen and nutrients. So the development of blood vessels in an essential step in the growth of a tumor. So without vessels, uh, tumors cannot grow larger than a smaller fraction of an inch unless they develop a blood supply. When the area around the cell in a tumor starts to get too far from a blood vessel, the oxygen and nutrient levels start to go down. So a decrease in oxygen is also called ap apoxia as we all know. So therefore, the tumor cells they start to produce some growth factors that stimulate the formation of blood vessels. So this process is known as the angiogenesis where the cancer cell stimulates the formation of blood vessels so as to say as so as to survive and as to get the oxygen and the nutrient supply so that it can multiply uh, faster. Next is the energy generating mechanism. Now most differentiated cells rely on mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation to satisfy the energy needs. Cell metabolized glucose to carbon dioxide by oxidation of pyruvate through the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle in the mitochondria. But most of the cancer cells however rely on glycolysis for energy production irrespective of whether oxygen levels are high or low. And the use of glycolysis to produce energy even in the presence of oxygen is called as aerobic glycolysis was first discovered in cancer cells. So cancer cells and proliferating cells convert most glucose to lactate regardless of whether oxygen is present or not. So the production of lactate in the presence of oxygen is called as the aerobic glycolysis as we can see in this diagram. 
uh, the differentiated tissues okay they use of glucose and which uh, undergoes the oxidative phosphorylation and the formation of lactate is very less but when it comes to the cancerous cell the proliferating tissues or the tumors they uh, take up the glycolysis pathway in such such a manner that the end product gives lactate which is 85 percent and there is almost only 5 percent of oxidative phosphorylation occurring. So in the net product there is an energy building blocks and NADPH being formed. So the cancer cells has an ability to escape in uh, built in limit to cell proliferation. They assist inhibitory signals that might otherwise stop their growth. They are genetically and epigenetically unstable. They have abnormal ability to survive stress and DNA damage. So this is an overview of changes in cell that causes, a can causes cancer. Now the differences between normal cell and cancer cell. So shape wise if you can see the normal cell is irregular but cancer cells are irregular. Uh, there is variation in size and shape. In normal cell, the growth in the cell division is controlled, but in cancer cell, it's uncontrolled. Apoptosis in normal cell is present, but in cancer cell, it's absent, so therefore making it immortal. The communication with nearby cells in normal cells is present, but in cancer cells, it's absent. The nucleus in normal cell is small and light, whereas in cancer cell, it's dark and large. Angiogenesis in normal cell, when a tissue, when a new tissues are formed or repaired, that's when that happens. But in cancer cells, angiogenesis occurs continuously. In a normal cell, the repair is present, but in cancer cell, it is absent. And normal cell do not spread, whereas cancer cell do spread by the process called metastasis. Now, the normal cell uh, is visible to human cell, uh, immune cell, whereas in cancer cell, it escapes the immune cells. The nutrient preference for a normal cell is glucose, fats and ketone but for cancer cell it is glucose. The energy source for a normal cell is glycolysis and the TCA cycle whereas for cancer cell it is maximally glycolysis and the contact inhibition is present in normal cells whereas it is lost in cancer cells. Now we can classify the cancers first on the basis of type of tumor. There are two types of tumor, one is benign tumor, the tumor that remains confined to its original location that is in them, in this uh, case the cancer cells do not uh, move to different places that is metastasis do not occur in this place. So the tumor is confined to a particular location only and can be easily uh, removed through surgery whereas the malignant tumor, the tumor that is capable of both invading surrounding normal tissue and spreading throughout the body. So in this particular tumor, the cancer cells uh, have the ability to metastasize. So this is the difference that where the benign tumor, they are slow growing mass, whereas the malignant tumor are fast growing mass. The benign tumor are non-invasive in nature, that is they are localized to a particular region, whereas the malignant tumor, they are invasive to other organ. The benign tumor, there is no spreading of metast or no spreading or metastasis occurring, whereas in malignant tumor, spreading or metastasis occurs. So this is a diagram showing the normal, uh, uh, normal cell and then after that the benign tumor and the malignant tumor. Now on the basis of origin, we can divide these both malignant and uh, benign tumors uh, on their, uh, based on their uh, embryonic tissue of origin. So most cancer falls into one or two main groups, one of the two main groups, one is cancer can be divided into carcinoma and sarcoma. So the cancer which comes under carcinoma are usually ectodermal or endodermal origin whereas the cancer that falls under sarcoma uh, is mesodermal in origin. So this is a list uh, that is uh, in uh, the cancer type which is the carcinoma, it eff uh, the affected area is skin, the epithelial cell. For sarcoma, the affected area is connective tissues like blood vessels, cartilage, bones, muscles. And for leukemia and lymphoma, it is the WBCs, the bone marrow and the lymphocytes. This is another table that is the types of cancer on the basis of origin of tissue. So there are few uh, tissue of origin and the name of the tumor like for nerve cell, if, the, if, if there is the tumor formation in the nerve cell, the tumor is known as neuroblastoma, in epithelial it is known as carcinoma, 
in blood vessels it is known as uh, lymphosarcoma white blood cell leukemia germ cell it is teratocarcinoma glial cells it is glioblastoma bone it is osteosarcoma connective tissue or muscle it is known as sarcoma now genes responsible for the onset of cancer cancer results from failure of the mechanism that usually control the growth and proliferation of cells genes responsible for the onset of cancer are known as cancer critical genes cancer critical genes are grouped into three broad classes according to whether the cancer risk arises from too much activity of the gene product or too little gene product so this is the cancer critical gene is divided into proto oncogene tumor suppressor gene and genome maintenance gene so the proto oncogenes they are actually normally these proto oncogenes they normally they promote cell growth but mutation in them changes them into oncogenes whose products are excessively active in growth promotion and uh, so basically proto oncogene when they divide they, it is the cell growth is being uh, what you say it has been maintained it has been limited or it has been restricted but when proto oncogene gets converted to oncogene the cell proliferation happens at a very high rate the second one is tumor suppressor gene so normally they restrain the growth so mutation in them inactivates them to allow inappropriate cell division then comes the genome maintenance gene in it is involved mainly in the ma uh, normally in maintaining the genome's integrity and mutation in them inactivates these genes and the cells acquire additional genetic changes at an increased rate leading to cancer so in this figure we can see how the cancer critical um, genes are been mutated so first one it can be it can be distinguished in two categories one is a dominant and recessive in the first one we can see how the overactivity mutation or the gain of mutation has a gain of function mutation has been occurred so a normal cell when a single mutation event occur it creates an oncogene so that is an one allele itself if there is uh, at one allele only if there is a uh, mutation then the activation of the oncogene uh, occur that is the proto oncogene gets converted to oncogene thereby promoting cell transformation whereas that is the gain of function that is in a single allele if mutation occurs then the um, the uh, gene gets activated whereas in the under activity mutation or the loss of function in this case when the normal cell when mutation occurs uh, the um, it tends to inactivate the tumor suppressor gene in one allele so when there was mutation only in one allele there was no effect of mutation in that one gene copy so the cell in the cell the tumor suppressor gene is still functional but when a second mutation event occur uh, it uh, happened that it inactivated the second gene copy so therefore to inactivate uh, inactivate the tumor suppressor gene both the genes have to be or both the alleles have to be mutated so two inactivated mutations functionally eliminates the tumor suppressor gene promoting cell transformation so in the a uh, proto oncogene or in the uh, gain of or in the overactivity mutation a single mutation was uh, sufficient for the conversion of proto oncogene into oncogene whereas uh, in the loss of function case where uh, in tumor suppressor gene there were two mutation was required for the conversion of the uh, for the suppression of the tumor suppressor gene now proto oncogenes conversion of a proto oncogene into an oncogene also called activation generally involves a gain of function mutation as we have seen previously however there arises a certain um, a central aspect of oncogene is that the gain of function mutation that converts proto oncogene to oncogene are genetically dominant that is mutation in only one of the two alleles is sufficient for the induction of cancer at least four mechanism can produce oncogenes from the corresponding proto oncogenes so they are as follows so in this figure we can see the type of accidents that can convert a proto oncogene into an oncogene the first one uh, deletion or point mutation in coding sequence of the proto oncogene can lead to the uh, mutation thereby forming the 
conversion of proto oncogene into oncogene. In second case, when a regulatory uh, regulatory uh, sequence was being mutated, uh, the normal protein which had to be synthesized at a very limited quantity start to greatly uh, uh, start to greatly overproduce, thereby again converting the proto oncogene into an oncogene. Now, gene amplif amplification when due to some mutation, uh, num so many uh, genes, a uh, uh, number of uh, gene copy increase, thereby uh, the normal protein was being um, synthesized, but it was greatly overproduced. Now, the chromosome rearrangements due to rearrangement in chromosomes, there is a chances where the nearby regulatory DNA sequence causes the normal protein to be overproduced and the fusion to actively transcribe gene produces hyperactive fusion protein. So, these are few accidents which can convert a proto-oncogene into an oncogene. These are some of the examples of proto-oncogene and their products. Now, RAS oncogene this is one of the examples of proto-oncogene. So, the newly discovered oncogene was clearly derived from mutation from a normal human gene one of these small family of proto-oncogenes called as RAS. The RAS oncogenes isolated from human tumors contain point mutation that create an hyperactive RAS protein that cannot shut itself off by hydrolyzing its bound GTP to GDP. So, because this makes a protein hyperactive, its effect is dominant that is only one of the cells two gene copies need to change to have an effect. So, one or another of the three human RAS family members is mutated in perhaps 30 percent of all human cancer. So, RAS gene are thus among the most important of all cancer critical gene. So, in this figure as we can see that in a normal RAS condition the growth factor comes it binds to the growth factor receptor and uh, the because of which the signal pathway starts where the GTP gets bind to the RAS and there the effector protein RAF comes and binds and uh, the signaling leads to the cell division and proliferation. Now, if there is no growth factor in the second case if there is no growth factor then uh, the there is no activation of the signaling pathway therefore, uh, the GDP uh, stays or uh, remains um, binded to the RAS. Uh, RAS thereby uh, in such a situation there is no division or no proliferation. Whereas, an oncogenic RAS even though if there is no growth factor or if there is no growth factor binding to the growth factor receptor, but still the pathway is on the mutant RAS is always on where the GTP, GTP is attached to the RAS and it is not getting hydrolyzed uh, into GDP and so because of that since the mutant RAS is on always, uh, the cell division and proliferation happens at a very high rate. Now, second is the tumor suppressor gene. Tumor suppressor gene generally encodes proteins that in one way or another inhibit cell proliferation. So, loss of function mutation in one or more of, of these proliferation inhibitory proteins contribute to the development of many cancers. So, uh, prominent among uh, the classes of proteins encoded by tumor suppressor genes are these five as follows. The first uh, tumor suppressor gene which is the intracellular, intracellular proteins, the main function is to regulate or inhibit uh, entry into the cell cycle, example P16 RB that is the retinoblastoma gene. Then the receptor or signal transducer for secreted hormones or developmental signals that inhibit cell proliferation the uh, tumor growth factor beta is the example. Then the checkpoint pathway proteins that is they arrest the cell cycle if the DNA is damaged. So, the example is P53. Then the proteins that promote apoptosis that uh, leads the damaged cell for apoptosis a type of program cell death. So, the examples of Puma and Noxa. Now, the fifth one is the enzymes that participate in DNA repair. So, it repairs it repairs double stranded or single stranded breaks of DNA example BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, P53, P53 
P53 gene product regulates both cell cycle progression and apoptosis. The DNA damage leads to rapid induction of P53 which activates transcription of both pro-apoptotic uh, and cell cycle inhibitory gene. So, as we can see in this diagram, a damaged DNA activated P53 and the P53 induced cell cycle arrest and apoptosis by activating P21 and Fumanoxa. So, this in this diagram we can see the mode of action of P53 of how due to some uh, mutation or due to uh, any uh, other reasons the DNA uh, uh, there was a DNA damage and because of which that led to the activation of P53 and P53 then um, starts to activate P21 and then further uh, it uh, inactivates or it stops or inhibits the cell cycle. There is another diagram showing the mode of action of P53. So, in this diagram we can see how uh, in a normal condition uh, how does the P53 work, but uh, in this next diagram we can see the normal condition uh, if there is any uh, in normal condition the normal P53 if there, if there is any DNA damage the cell cycle abnormalities or any hypoxia the P53 gets activated the cell cycle gets arrested and uh, apoptosis or the apoptosis gets initiated, but when the P53 is mutated the DNA damage during any DNA damage or during cell cycle abnormalities or hypoxia the cell cycle instead of stopping and getting arrest instead of getting arrested or instead of doing the correction or instead of going under apoptosis the cell cycle continues on with that with that mutation or with that damage. So, therefore, the cells in turn becomes cancerous in nature this is how the P53 works. The next one is retinoblastoma. So, the key insight that led to the discovery of the first tumor suppressor gene came from studies of a rare type of human cancer retinoblastoma which arises from cells in the retina of the eye that are converted into a cancerous state by an unusually small number of mutations. So, retinoblastoma occurs in childhood and tumors develop from neural precursor cells in the immature retina. So, this is a diagram where the, there is a gen, uh, where the genetic mechanism that causes a retinoblastoma is shown. So, initially over here in the first, uh, first case it is a normal healthy individual ok there are um, the cells are normal only there is one cell uh, which is high, which is inactivate uh, whose uh, one uh, gene is being inactivated, but still as we know tumor suppressor gene are recessive in nature and for its uh, suppression or for its inactivation both the gene copies have to be mutated. So, uh, right now over here only one copy is being mutated so therefore, there is no tumor. Now, in case of hereditary retinoblastoma so the initially uh, in the initial cell there was an inherited mutant RB gene or retinoblastoma gene present. Now, in its offsprings we can see that there are three, care, three um, progenies which has Go, which has only a single mutation in one of the single gene, but one progeny has uh, the mutation in both of its gene progeny. Therefore, that led to the excessive cell proliferation leading to retinoblastoma. So, most people with inherited mutant mutation develop multiple tumors in both the eyes. And in non-hereditary retinoblastoma, again, um, occasional cell inactivates one of its two good RB genes that happens occasionally, but again due to some mutation again occasional cells again inactivates its only good RB gene copy and due to again this happens spontaneously or due to some uh, mutation and the cells uh, when um, it got mutated it led to the excessive cell proliferation leading to retinoblastoma. So, only about 1 in 30,000 normal people develop one tumor in one eye. Now, in this usually during the G1 or S transition, if the cell is not ready for the G1 to S transition from G1 phase to S transition, the retinoblastoma it uh, inactivates the E2F. So, therefore, the E2F cannot bind to the DNA for transcription and so therefore, there is no transcription and no G1 to S phase switching occurs and the cell cycle gets arrested. 
but when the cell cycle is ready for G1 to S transition, when the cell is ready for G1 to S transition, that time the cycling D and the CDK4 or 6 phosphorylates a retinoblastoma, thereby activating the E2F and this E2F binds to DNA and the transcription of cyclins uh, occurs thereby G1 to S transition takes place and the normal cell division occurs. So, this is basically how uh, in a normal cell condition how the retinoblastoma works. But mutation in retinoblastoma can lead to the continuous activation, uh, continuous phosphorylation of retinoblastoma and continuous activation of E2F factor even though if the cell is not ready for G1 to S transition. So, that can lead to cancer. So, this is an image of a child affected with retinoblastoma. Now, genome maintenance gene, a third class of gene often linked to cancer called genome maintenance gene are involved in maintaining the genome's integrity. So, when these genes are inactivated, cell acquire additional genetic changes at an increased rate including mutation that causes the deregulation of cell growth and proliferation and leads to cancer. So, BRCA1 and HMLLH1 affects the genome stability when mutated. So, this was the gene responsible for cancer. Then there are carcinogens that these are the agents that initiate or promote tumor formation called as carcinogens. So, the ability of carcinogens to induce cancer can be accounted for the DNA damage that they cause and by the error introduced into the DNA during the cell's efforts to repair this damage. So, there are three classes of carcinogenic agents known. They are the physical carcinogens, the chemical carcinogens and the biological or oncovirus carcinogens. So, in a physical carcinogens, uh, radiations like UV, gamma rays, beta rays uh, is there. Then uh, the chemical carcinogen, uh, carcinogens are aflatoxin, benzene, arsenic, cadmium, radon, etc. In biological carcinogens, DNA containing oncovirus, DNA containing uh, RNA containing oncovirus all can act as an arc, uh, carcinogens. So, here we have come to the end of the biology of cancer. Before that, these are the few common early uh, signs for detection of cancer. And these are some of the main methods of cancer diagnosis and there are some of the types of cancer treatment. These are the references. Thank you.